So then the structure of eukaryotes is quite a bit different than the prokaryotes. One, as I previously mentioned, they're a lot bigger, usually about 10 to 100 microns. Um, it has some similarities, but really one of the big differences is that it's compartmentalized uh, w within the actual cell itself. It's got an internal structure with membrane-bound organelles, such as a nucleus. The nucleus holds the DNA. It's got a double membrane uh, called the nuclear envelope, and it has pores within it, so messenger RNA can go in and out of that, uh, that nucleus. Uh, the DNA DNA within eukaryotes is linear. Uh, it's a double helix form or structure rather than a circular loop uh, as we see in prokaryotes and it's arranged in beads within nucleosomes and we'll look at those uh, momentarily. Um, eukaryotes include plants, animals, fungi uh, or would be examples of different types of eukaryotic organisms. The ribosomes of eukaryotes are ADS so they're a little bit different in, in size and shape uh, than what we see in prokaryotes and another organelle that's essential to the function of eukaryotes is a mitochondria and this organelle is a double membrane organelle it conducts aerobic respiration to be able to produce cellular energy ATP uh, and it carries out a lot of its own functions including it has its own DNA and the ability to produce ribosomes and proteins. All living organisms carry out some essential functions uh, that are necessary to their survival. And in multicellular organisms, different cells have the responsibility of carrying out some of these different jobs. Uh, cells can become specialized. In prokaryotes and single-celled organisms, the, each individual cell has to do all of these different functions for that organism to be able to exist. Um, and so uh, what are those different functions? One would be homeostasis. Uh, there needs to be the ability for the cell to be able to maintain an internal environment that may be different from the external. Uh, and that has to be a constant uh, balance or internal environment. There needs to be the ability to, to perform metabolism. Uh, biochemical reactions occurring within the organism must take place. Nutrition, there must be some sort of uh, supply of nutrition, whether that's eating something or producing own energy through photosynthesis. And that would be used for growth and repair, excretion, removal of waste uh, that's no longer needed by the cell, growth, an increase in size like uh, of the individual organism or the number of cells, uh, a response to stimuli, being able to carry out an action in response to some external environmental stimulus and the, be able, uh, the ability to be able to reproduce. Um, the production of offspring, whether that be through sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. And so then two examples of uh, a single cell organism that carries out all of these different functions. The first would be a paramecium. And this is a unicellular organism, organism that can be found in pond water. Uh, it does have a nucleus. Uh, it oftentimes reproduces asexually. It has a cell membrane. It has a food vacuole where food is digested and nutrients are released into the cytoplasm. So a vacuole is a, essentially a, a large storage um, container uh, that's gonna hold, hold the food. Uh, metabolic reactions take place in the cytoplasm and it has a contractile vacuole, which is pretty cool. It essentially takes in water and then can pump it out and that's how it gets around. That's what it's used for movement. It does have cilia uh, externally, little hairs that, that help with uh, movement also. And um, if you collect some pond water, you can oftentimes find these because uh, they're found in pond water. And this would be an example of a unicellular organism and how it maintains its uh, existence using some of these different uh, functions of living organisms. Our second example is the Chlamydomonas, and it's a unicellular algae that lives in soil uh, as well as fresh water. It has a nucleus. It can divide by uh, and reproduce by asexual or sexual reproduction. Just like we saw with the paramecium, metabolic reactions take place within the cytoplasm. It has a cell wall and membrane to be able to separate its internal and external environment. It also does have a contractile vacuole that holds water and helps to ensure uh, homeostasis. It performs photosynthesis uh, as an algae cell, so it's able to produce its own uh, sugars that then are used to be able to make ATP. And it also has a flagella that helps with movement. And so this is also an example of a unicellular organism that can exist and flourish because it, uh, it conducts all of those different processes of life. So here, let's now compare some of the uh, different types of eukaryotic cells, which is going to include animals, fungi, and plants. 
Uh, the chart here is pretty self-explanatory, but we'll hit some of the, the highlights. Um, one of the, the first things is plants have chloroplasts. Animals and fungi do not. And with plants having chloroplasts, that uh, uh, provides them the ability to be able to photosynthesize and thus produce their own sugars uh, that they would then use for energy and to be able to survive. Uh, one of the other big differences between plants and animals or fungi is that uh, the cell wall is not present in animal cells. Fungi can have it, plants do have it, uh, made of different things. In fungi, it's made of uh, chitin, and in plants, cellulose. Vacuoles are also a big difference between plant animal cells and fungi. The vacuole in animal cells is small and typically more for storage of, of um, uh, food, water. Uh, within plants, it's much larger. Typically, there's a one large central vacuole, and so that um, uh, is, a, is a big difference between animal cells. Centrioles present in animal cells, uh, not so in plants. And then cilia and flagella, uh, oftentimes in animals, um, uh, typically used for movement. A, a good example in animal cells would be a sperm. A uh, cell has a flagella for, for swimming. Um, less so found in plants and fungi cells. We previously discussed the cell theory and the different components that all cells have, uh, kind of the general expectations of cells and the structures that they have and their size. However, in biology, typically there are always some exceptions to what we would expect to see. And th that is the same for the cell theory. Uh, not all cells exactly agree with, with this theory. And some examples would be, uh, the first would be red blood cells. Uh, what's unique about them is that they don't have a nucleus uh, and they're much smaller than a typical cell of 10 to 100 microns. Uh, they're also more flexible, which makes sense because they're traveling through small uh, tubes essentially to be able to transport oxygen throughout the body. Um, and so uh, they're different, much different than other cells, uh, particularly in that they don't have a nucleus. They also can't repair themselves and they have a pretty short lifespan, 100 to 120 days, uh, whereas some cells can live much longer or persist f for the duration of, of uh, the organism's life. Um, so very different than what we would expect with the cell theory. Uh, another example seen in plants are phloem sieve tubes. And these are tubes within the plant, uh, almost kind of like a straw, in that it's used to be able to transport sap, uh, a sugar water mixture within plants. And what's unique about the phloem sieve tubes is that they have a disc-like structure within the tube. There's a disc and that disc has got little holes in it and um, they allow for sap to pass through it. During the development of the phloem sieve tubes, also uh, the nucleus as well as most of the other cell components break down and, and are not there in the mature phloem tubes. Uh, uh, cells and, and the only part that really remains is the plasma membrane which um, helps to maintain the pressure and allows uh, the cell to maintain its shape. It's also lastly uh, located next to the companion cell and it helps load sugars into and out of the sieve tubes uh, and it helps to ensure the sieve survival. So it, it's really missing a lot of the organelles that we would typically see in a plant cell um, and, it, and it's very different than what we would expect with the cell theory. A third example is skeletal muscle. And really what happens here is multiple cells are fusing together. And so this creates the muscle fibers. And as a result of that, then what's an individual cell has multiple nuclei because multiple of the cells have fused together into one. And so they have multiple nuclei. The last example is uh, called a fungal hyphae. And in this cell, the, um, the uniqueness is that the nucleus divides repeatedly without cell division. So it also has multiple nuclei. Uh, but the cell remains as one. And so it gets many nuclei, uh, but it only remains one cell. And so typically we see most cells fit with the cell theory, but we do have some exceptions and these would all be examples. So depending on your location in your class, you may or may not be able to look at the different organelles of plant or animal cells under a microscope. And ideally, you really wanna be able to look at uh, the different types of organelles as electron micrograph images, uh, because it's much more detailed and you can see them uh, more specifically. If you're in my class, we'll do uh, this in class. If you're not, I would recommend that you spend some time uh, Google searching or using your textbooks or hopefully you do it in class to be able to identify some different different organelles. And so the ones that you really need to focus on uh, have kind of a list here for you. Uh, firstly is the nucleus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum or the rough ER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, there's a difference between the two, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, mitochondria, free floating ribosomes, uh, as well as attached ribosomes, what we see on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, there's some differences between those. Chloroplasts, vacuoles and vac uh, vesicles, microtubules and centrioles, the cytoskeleton, 
flagella, and cilia. That would be the primary organelles that you would want to be able to recognize and or draw and know the functions of each of those. We've discussed uh, the development of cells and prokaryotic cells, and now we want to turn our attention to how did eukaryotic cells evolve. And this uh, is explained by the endosymbiosis uh, theory of eukaryotic cell evolution and how they developed. To break that down and to explain that a little bit further, symbiosis is the living in close association with one another. Uh, and there's multiple different forms of that. You've probably heard of a parasitic relationship in which one organism benefits and the other is harmed. Uh, the opposite of that would be a mutualistic relationship where, where both organisms benefit. Um, and so how eukaryotic cells probably developed uh, we have actually a lot of pretty solid evidence for this, uh, is through a process called endocytosis. And we'll discuss this a little bit more uh, in, in a future unit, but this is essentially the taking in of uh, external particles um, by the membrane surrounding something and kind of pulling it in. And an example of this is uh, in humans, um, our phagocytes uh, cells ingest viruses uh, or bacteria for destruction, and so they essentially surround uh, the, the bacteria or the viruses and then destroy them. Uh, paramecium uses the process also to acquire food. Uh, an amoeba would be another example. And so it's ingesting a, of smaller cells or smaller components into the, lar into the larger cell. This process is probably what led to eukaryotic cells, except that rather than it becoming food or for destruction, uh, the, the relationship was mutualistic. Uh, the organism that was engulfed wasn't killed, but the two lived in harmony with one another. So it'd be a, a larger cell engulfing or surrounding a smaller cell. And rather than using it for food, it was actually beneficial for the larger cell to keep it alive. Um, and this is probably best exemplified by mitochondria. Mitochondria is an organelle that uh, uh, does aerobic respiration and provides ATP, cellular energy. And so if a larger cell engulfed this mitochondria uh, as a free living prokaryote, a, a previously uh, modern day mitochondria, but previously a free living prokaryote was ingested by a larger prokaryote, rather than it digesting it and using it as food, it allowed it to live. And that thereby provided the, the larger cell with a, a continual source of energy. And that was probably beneficial and allowed that cell to have a better chance of survival than other cells that didn't have what we call now a mitochondria inside of it. Um, and so that would be favored by natural selection. Uh, and while it can't be completely proven, we do have a lot of evidence that, that supports this. One, the mitochondria has a double membrane. Uh, a chloroplast would also be another example of this, and chloroplasts also have double membranes. Uh, they, all, they both have their own DNA in a circular molecule, much like modern prokaryotes. They can transcribe their own genes and synthesize their own proteins as a result. They have 70S proteins, which we previously talked about is a, a characteristic of prokaryotic cells, and they produce by division of pre-existing cells. So they actually divide and replicate on their own. And so this would be the, the way that we see a lot of the organelles, particularly mitochondria and chloroplasts, how they would have developed in eukaryotic cells. Other organelles are probably would have been formed by the infolding of the external membrane that then had some selective advantage that led to the development of other organelles that we see within cells today. Endosymbiosis would be the primary explanation of how eukaryotic cells developed over time. While prokaryotic cells have just a single cell uh, that maintains all of the functions of life, eukaryotic cells have uh, thousands, millions of cells, trillions of cells, and typically each one of those cells are going to have some different functions. Uh, they're specialized to be able to carry out different jobs to help the organism to be able to survive. And so then what allows those cells to become different or uh, the process of cell differentiation? If you step back for a moment and you think of any animal or human for that matter, sperm and egg cell combine uh, to form one single cell called a zygote. And that's that fertilized egg, that zygote then divides and divides and divides many, many times. Uh, to eventually produce the offspring um, that then is, uh, grows into an adult organism. Where then did the DNA for that organism come from? Well, really it came from the individual sperm and egg fusing to make that zygote. And so all of the cells in an organism come from, for sexually reproducing organisms, come from one individual cell. And so that really means that every cell in 
in the organism has the same DNA because the DNA is copied before the cell completely copies through the process of mitosis. Uh, and so every cell has the same DNA. How then do cells become specialized or how do cells uh, differentiate? Uh, how do they become different? Really, it's all dependent on that DNA. And there's about 4,000 genes that are active in all different types of cells. And really what makes each cell type different is which of those genes are turned on or off. I like to use the analogy of a light switch. Uh, this is very simplified here, but essentially in some different types of cells, some light switch uh, switches are turned on and some are turned off or expressed at different amounts. And this allows cells to become different types of cells based off of the the production of proteins from those genes uh, being present or absent. And gene expression controls all of this process. And so it allows for different types of cells, muscle cells, heart cells, skin cells, et cetera, and humans to be produced all from the same set of DNA. And it's really an amazing process because every cell has the same DNA, it's just which of those genes are activated is what dictates which type of cells are produced. Being an organism that has multi-cells or a eukaryotic organism definitely has some benefits, some advantages. Uh, typically, they have longer lifespans. Uh, they're oftentimes much larger than a single-celled organism, and that allows them to exploit different niches or more niches than a, a single-celled organism. And they have complexity and differentiation, as we just talked about. And so uh, multicellular organisms have some benefits compared to a single-celled organism. Plants and animals are all multicellular. Uh, and plants, probably mul uh, having multicellular plants, evolved multiple times in different types of plants and evolved at least once in the process in the development of animals. Most fungi and eukaryotic algae are multicellular. Uh, some prokaryotes even cooperate to form a multicellular grouping. Um, and, and so, most of what we see are multicellular organisms. However, the biomass that's on the planet is primarily single-celled organisms because there are so many uh, prokaryotes, bacteria that live on the planet. Cells of multicellular organisms have lost their ability to survive independently. And this is also a benefit uh, in that if one cell dies, the organism doesn't also die. It doesn't perish. It has the ability to replace typically that, that cell that's lost. And so uh, the evolution of multicellular organisms has a chain is, is happened differently depending on whether plants or animals, um, but exist because of some of the different benefits that they uh, have compared to prokaryotes.